DK Metcalf from the Seattle Seahawks, and you're watching NorCal. What's up, everybody? This is Norb Cab coming at you on this Blue Friday. Yes, I still call this a Blue Friday, even though the Seahawks aren't playing. It's still Blue Friday every Friday. Uh, but I'm very excited today uh, for this edition of the Roundtable. Uh, it's a very special one because we are very fortunate to have a very special guest, Kurt Warner, former Seahawks running back and Ring of Honor member. He is going to be joining the show in about 10 minutes, and I'm very excited to, to have him to be able to talk a little bit about what's going on with the Seahawks, get his perspective as a player who played back in the 80s, uh, helped lead the Seahawks to one of their first ever playoff wins. Uh, so he's definitely a big part of the uh, uh, history of the Seahawks that uh, was, a, was a huge um, monumental milestone. So I'm excited to have Kurt joining the show in a few minutes. Uh, so uh, at this point, I got a couple members of the roundtable joining us in uh, gradually, but right now I'm going to bring in uh, the one who's in the table right now, and that is the one and only Squabo says Squabo all the way from you're over in Pullman, right? Over in Wazoo. Yes. All right. So we are joined by Squabo says Squabo. Uh, for any for anybody who's watching this who may not know you which I'd be surprised because you are moving up in the world. Uh, Squabo says, uh, tell everybody uh, a little bit about what you do, you know, what you are all about and where you're going, man. Hey, uh, I'm Squabo. I'm a broadcast news student, a communications major at Washington State University. Uh, I have my own YouTube channel that Squabo says. Brought to you, you know, everything I've learned about YouTube, I've learned pretty much 90% of it from Mr. Norb Kim himself, the OG. So major props, major thanks. Uh, he taught me how to stream and all that good stuff. Speaking of streaming, it, at about three o'clock, we're going to do our weekly show where we're going to break down the divisional uh, round of the playoffs. We got some exciting matchups coming up. I know, uh, Norb, we're going to touch on them here today. Uh, immediately after the show is over, though, definitely go check it out on my YouTube channel at Squabo Says. I'm just a student trying to talk sports in the world. All right. All right. Glad to have you on here. We'll have Steezy here as well as uh, Daniel Dovin, who's been sponsoring and being a part of an active part of this show all year round uh, for this past season. So they will be joining the show in part uh, as we go along here. So, uh, Squabble, I guess for right now, it's just you and I. So we'll get the ball rolling as we're waiting for Kurt to join in about five minutes. Uh, Steezy should be rolling along in here, too. So, um, I want to just start by talking about how the season ended with the Seahawks. Uh, you know, we have obviously it's been a disappointing season. You know, we were out knocked out of the playoffs early, uh, earlier than we wanted to be. And yet uh, we finished on a really good note. We paid, put a 50 burger on the Lions at home. And then we went and took care of the uh, Arizona Cardinals, who I don't know, after watching that playoff game, maybe they weren't as strong of a team as we all thought uh, the way they got dismantled uh, over the weekend. So we put a whooping on them though. And maybe that tenderized them for the Rams to just completely finish them off. But how much do you take in the way that this season finished? How much do you feel like that means something in terms of momentum and building on something going into next year? Or are these just two games that don't really count for anything? I'm just curious your take on the finish we had. Yeah, no, and Norb, I, I think it's the ultimate sign of a winning organization, right? When your season is over, when you've been eliminated, uh, whether by crook or by whatever reason it is, right? If you want to blame the Rams game, if, if you want to blame the officials, if you want to blame Russell Wilson's injury, whatever it is, our season is over and we go out and Pete Carroll has that mentality. And I, I really do love this mentality. And many of you know that I've been watching the show. I've been very critical of Pete Carroll. I love this mentality though. And the fact that he said versus Detroit, that's the NFC championship game. And at Arizona is our Super Bowl because that's the only way that they know how to function is to try and win every single game. That is what is going to keep potentially Pete Carroll in Seattle. And yes, nor we have a bet about this. It looks like I'm probably going to be buying you a steak because unless Russell Wilson gets traded, I think both individuals are staying put at this point. We do need to talk about the potential of Russell Wilson leaving though. And we are going to, we are going to talk about that because um, just when we thought everything was hunky dory and we were all copacetic and everything was cool. We get more drama, but 
this is kind of the world we live in, right? Uh, yeah. I just see now that uh, we do have uh, Mr. Kurt Warner on the phone. Now, I want to make sure that uh, I can hear him okay. So this is a technological feat here. And if we can pull this thing off. Kurt, are you there? Mr. Hey. Kurt Warner. Come on, technology. Don't let me down. Hey, Kurt, are you there? We at least have I'm some... here. How about hey, you? there you he is. All right, man. Uh, I'm traveling. I'm on the road. So uh, I, I apologize uh, in advance if uh, if I lose uh, connection with you guys. But I'll try to stay with you as long as I can. Well, uh, we, we'll take every minute, every second that we can with you, uh, Kurt. Uh, thank you again for taking the time to be on the show. Uh, again, I mentioned at the top of the hour, Kurt Warner, the Ring of Honor, former Seahawks running back, uh, played uh, with the Seahawks from, it was 1980, was it 83? Uh, was that the first year? 83. 83. 83. And that was a great yeah, year. Yeah. That was a great year because the Seahawks won their first playoff game and uh, you brought some great joy to the city of Seattle. Uh, Kurt, maybe as a way to start, um, maybe you could talk just a little bit about reminiscing on that first year with the Seahawks, that first playoff appearance for Seattle. What was that season like for you, man? Well, uh, in one pick, you know, I was always on the first call regardless, but the actual season itself, was a uh, it was uh, it was a fun season uh, being able to play with guys that were just talented all the way around offensively defensively uh, we were able to bring in a coach by the name of Coach Knox Chuck Knox and uh, put together a a winning combination so it was a lot of fun anytime you win it's always fun. Yes, uh, absolutely. Winning solves all uh, problems, you know, that uh, <laughs> the team has. And of course, when you don't win, we we uh, have lots seemingly uh, lots of problems. We're, we're, we're having these. We're having lots of discussions about so uh, we're not winning when you're right. not winning. Yeah, I want to make sure that people yeah. out there listening. Can you guys? Uh, someone just confirm that they can hear uh, Kurt. Okay, I think he's coming in through the system. All right. I just want to make sure that uh, uh, you can be heard. So. Um, I uh, especially guess Kurt Warner, uh, former running back, Ring of Honor member of the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, Kurt, I uh, just wanted to get your take. We, I was just asking, uh, Squabo says, about the uh, the end of this uh, season. I want to get your take on, you know, as you've been watching the Seahawks this season, obviously it's been a, a disappointing one. What's your take on what you saw of the Seattle Seahawks this year? You know, what? why do you think the Seahawks struggled so much uh, in terms of just – you know, not being able to pull wins together this year like they normally have. Well, let me just say this about uh, the NFL and, and the Seahawks in general. Uh, number one, the, the NFL does not reward you for winning. Uh, and, and that's due to the fact that uh, the, the NFL uh, believes in, in balancing things out. So, for example, if you're winning quite a bit, which the Seahawks have been winning, uh, you get later picks. You get later picks. You may not get as much talent as someone that, that's having a, a, an earlier pick. Uh, having a little connection issue there. Kurt, you still there? Coming together, and maybe the Seahawks just aren't as talented at every position as it once was maybe four or five years ago. So you got to take those things into account. And then you got to look at the system itself and you got to say, well, how are the coaches coaching? Uh, obviously there was a defensive coordinator that was let go uh, just recent, probably a couple of days ago. So, you know, it, it's a, it's a tough situation to be in. And, and hopefully, you know, the Seahawks can uh, work their way out of it and get back to playing at a, at a higher level. But you got to keep in mind that the, that the division itself is playing at a higher, high level as well. So it's a lot of things that come into play. Yeah. The division 
all three three teams out of the NFC West and could have had four teams. If the Seahawks could have played a little bit better, we could have had four teams out of the NFC West in this playoffs this year, and we are the ones left out of the party. So sad. But, uh, you know, it's uh, – that's kind of a sign of, of where this uh, this division is. We have Steezy. Steezy A. Smith is in the house. Uh, glad that uh, you're able to join, Steezy. Uh, welcome to the roundtable. Say hi to everybody. Great, Steezy. Uh, glad to have you on here, man. Norb, Norb, it's always a pleasure. Squab, how you doing, my brother? Um, sorry I'm running a little late, but I hope you guys are having a great time. And, uh, man, it's been a while. Missed you guys. Hey. Yeah, yeah, no, it's great to have uh, all of us together. We'll have Daniel joining us a little bit later, and of course, we got Kurt Warner, a special guest on uh, the show today. I want to—I'm definitely going to have the guys ask you some questions, uh, but I want to ask you this particular one. Um, and by the way, Ancient Hawk Forty Eight, thank you for the super chat. Appreciate it, uh, Kurt. So, you know, the uh, Rashad Penny. Everybody, I think, up until about four weeks ago, thought, all right, we're done with him. He's another CJ Pro size. This guy can't stay healthy. Send him off. And all of a sudden, it's like, hold on a second. What is this? We got to bring this guy back. Why didn't we sign him to his uh, fifth year option? But, you know, so I'm just curious your take on seeing Rashad Penny as a running back yourself, former running back, um, who's been through the same injury. He, he tore an ACL, you tore an ACL in your early in your career. What do you think about Rashad Penny? Should the Seahawks bring him back? What do you see in him? Is he a running back of the future for the Seattle Seahawks? Well, I think if you're if you're the Seattle Seahawks, you have to evaluate the other years, his rookie year, his second year, his third year, and his fourth year, which I think was this year. Uh, so uh, it looks like the light bulb came on somewhere along the line and perhaps he figured it out uh, as to how the game is played, what type of preparation you're going to need to play this game, and uh, what uh, his uh, talent, talent level is. So the light bulb could have just come on, and it's, it, obviously it's a great time for him that it did come on, and uh, I think it's going to make it tough for the Seahawks to let him go uh, at this particular juncture because there's going to be a lot of teams that are going to be interested in bringing him on board in my opinion. Yeah. So there, there might be a bidding war. So I guess just speculating since we all are, you know, we all can just say our opinions here and, 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 and get our take. And I want to get the guys takes here as well. Uh, it sounds like we should bring him back. The question is, will he be back? He said on, in a press conference, he wants to be back in Seattle, but do you think he will Kurt? What do you think? Will he be back in the Seahawks uniform uh, next season? Well, I, I think that it takes more to do Bring him back, uh, but I think it's just going to come down to you know what uh, what he thinks he's worth and what the Seahawks think he's worth. So it, it's up in the air right now. Uh, he wants to come back. It sounds like he does, but I think he wants to get paid as well. Well, he definitely wants to get paid. So, but you're, you're you're doing the Russell Wilson thing, man. You're 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 not you're not giving me the straight answer. All right. Oh, I, okay. I, I, <laughs> Give I'll, me an answer, man. This I, is. A, I'll tell you. All right, I'll answer the question for you. Yeah, because you know, no, nobody watches the show anyway, so no one's going to hear your opinion and really uh, hold you against hold it against you if you're right or wrong. So just throw it out there, man. What do you think? Does he come back or not? I, I don't, I don't think he's going to come back. Really? Yeah. Because, why? Because he's going to ask for more money, and they're going to say, "Well, I, I don't want to pay that." So that's really what it's going to come down to. So if, yeah, I don't I don't think they're, they're going to meet what he's asking for, uh, based on his past performance. So, you know, it, I, unfortunately, it is a business that we're in, that they're in, and uh, from that perspective, probably not. Wow! Hmm. So he's going to get he's going to get sold off to the highest bidder, basically, is what you're saying. Hmm. That would be very well. Well, yeah, in a word, yes, I am saying that because uh, you know, at some point, somebody's going to want to pay him what he thinks he's worth, and there you have it. So, to, to the highest bidder, uh, I, I think he he's going to go. I think he likes the Seahawks. I think he likes the organization, uh, but he may be looking for a change. Show me the money, right? <laughs> he's gonna... Well, I mean, you oh. you can only play so many you can only play so many years in the NFL, and then you're not going to be playing any longer regardless of who you are. So, you know, right. you, you, you've got to make decisions that are best for you 
uh, and your family and, and friends, but yet at the same time, hopefully you can stick around because obviously the Seahawks is a great organization to play for, uh, but uh, I, it, it's going to be difficult for him to stick around, I think. Hmm. Let, me, let me go to the panel here. They go to uh, Steezy and Squabo, and you can answer this or you can you can uh, you can know, ask uh, back to Kurt, but what's your guys' take on the Rashad Penn thing? I, uh, Squabo, I saw your reaction first was like your eyes went open, your mouth dropped when Kurt said he won't be back. I think we all think he should be back, but the, the point is we can't control where he goes. <laughs> he, he can go wherever the heck he wants because he's a free agent. Squabo, what's your thoughts on it? Yep. Well, and honestly, that's what I'm afraid of is exactly what Kurt's talking about. What I'm afraid of is that Rashad Penny had a phenomenal stretch to end the year, and he put himself in conversations in uh, statistical categories with some of the best running backs in the NFL who had all season to do it, and he played half the year. So wh- I what I'm afraid of is – Exactly what Kurt's talking about is that Rashad Penny gets this idea of, okay, I just did all this and I'm worth so much now when the best available, the best ability is availability. And for half the year, especially when Russell Wilson was injured and we needed him the most, he was unavailable. That being the case, knowing that for the first three years of his career, he's been unavailable as well. That means that we can't give him a huge chunk of change. So I'm hoping that Rashad Penny is able to come to some form of agreement with Seattle, understanding that this is a place that supported him while he was getting hated on by the entire NFL community after we drafted him in the first round and he was going through those difficult times. Remember, after he had his first couple of games of success later on in the season, he came out and spoke about those low times that he was at and how the franchise and those that were close to him really helped support him while everyone outside did not. So I hope that he just appreciates his roots. He remembers that Seattle's a team that drafted him, and I hope that he has a lower expectation and that allows him to stay in Seattle. Uh, how about you, How about you, Steezy? What's your thoughts yeah. on it? First of all, I just want to say uh, hello to Mr. Kurt Warner. I'm Steezy A. Smith. Nice to meet you, sir. Um, as far as the Rashad nice Penny well. question, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I don't think his market's going to be as robust as people think. You know, we could look at Chris Carson, for example. Let's not forget Chris Carson. We all know he's injury prone, right? But he also has two seasons finishing top five in the NFL in rushing yards. What did that get him last year? Two years and 10.4 million. And, and so for us, that was a bargain. That was a steal. And I know Rashad Penny lit the NFL up on fire. I mean, what was it, 208 more rushing yards than the next best guy in the same span last five to six weeks of the season? Jonathan Taylor, we're talking about Jonathan Taylor, arguably the best running back of football, not named Derrick Henry. And so to outrun him by more than 200 yards, I mean, that's an accomplishment in and of itself. But going back to what Squabo was saying, his production this year, 91% of his rushing yards, of his career rushing yards came this year. And as Mr. Kurt Warner alluded to earlier, he's been in the NFL for four years. And we're talking about 91% of his career production in one year, in 10 games this year. And so, yes, he had a phenomenal ending. He was arguably the best running back in football for the last month plus. But look at some of the competition. Detroit, Chicago, Houston. These are some of the worst defenses in football. And his, his impact on the offense, it was undeniable. You know, I think before Rashad Penny kind of emerged, We were averaging 19.9 points a game. And by the end of the year, we were averaging north of 23. And so that's only a four-point swing. But with how abysmal, with how anemic, with how pathetic the offense was, his impact opened up so many different things. It opened up play action. It opened things up for Russell Wilson. It opened things up for the rest of the offense. Heck, the offensive line even looked better. Maybe because the offensive line's built, in my eyes at least, to run the football. And so, yes, he did all these great things. But at the end of the day, I mean – He's played in 37 out of 65 career games. And so all those things have to be taken into account. We also know that running backs, you can find them anywhere in the NFL draft. Rounds one through seven, undrafted guys are are coming out to becoming stars. Uh, Guys that, you know, have failed at previous stops. We see these guys becoming stars. And so I don't think anyone's going to be in a rush to throw Rashad Penny all the money in the world. He certainly deserves it. But at the end of the day, like Squabba always says, availability is the best ability. And while he was able to demonstrate that for a good five to six weeks, we had to look at the rest of his body of work. And he just has not been able to prove that. And so maybe when when talking about a potential contract, we could look at, you know, some high numbers, maybe five to six, maybe even seven million annually. But I think that a lot of that is going to be incentive laden. I think a lot of that uh, it won't be guaranteed. And so he's probably going to have to I hate to say this because it might come off wrong. 
but I, I think he's gonna have to earn you know his next contract and what am i what i mean by that is the incentives have to be high the guarantees can't be super high and it, it's just gonna motivate him to be even better and, and to stay healthy hopefully and so obviously health isn't really something you can always control but i just feel like other teams had to pay attention to what he did and to what he didn't do his first three years and he's probably gonna get you know i feel like a, a fair and a reasonable deal and i hope that comes with seattle you know i don't know if we have the option to franchise tag him and we usually don't do that we refrain from doing that but that is also a potential last minute option if he somehow manages to price himself out of seattle and we also do have north of 50 plus million in cap space and so if we do have to tie up you know seven to eight mil you know with low guarantees i, I think he definitely uh, he's earned that so that's kind of where i stand on the rashad penny situation that's, that's well said so i for the record i i hope that kurt warner is wrong and i hope that you guys are right because i i do i, I take every i take I, I take everything i said bad about rashad penny i take every joke take and every and i apologize on this behalf of the city of seattle and all the fans for all the the crap that we gave you rashad penny i hope you come back and and, and make a deal because man we needed you and we really Imagine this. This offense, you know, was 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 really looked at as what's wrong with this offense? You know, uh, Russell Wilson, this and you know, the offense that, offensive coordinator, this. But look, we lost Chris Carson. He was the he was supposed to be the engine that ran this this system with Rashad Penny as the second piston in it. Mm -hmm. We didn't have both those guys really ever during this whole year. Imagine those two. If Rashad Penny were to run the version we saw over the last four weeks and the Chris Carson that we know is what he could do imagine those two running backs in our backfield healthy and going at the same time i know that's a big if but imagine that happening we would have seen more than what we saw in the last four games because we would have seen the two of them going so this offense would have been completely different that's why i feel like a lot of the blame that's been going around with the offense isn't necessarily what we've been doing wrong it's just what we haven't had because those weapons were taken away from us because yeah, I love myself some running backs. Kurt Warner, man, dude, I remember watching you as a kid, man. And, uh, you know, it was like, who is this guy? This guy's freaking awesome. <laughs> you know, We're going to the playoffs. Thank you, Kurt Warner. You know, and so, I, and even now, that's why I think it's funny when people talk about uh, uh, Pete Carroll wants to run the ball and he's antiquated. It's like, you've got to run the football. You've got to run the football. Squabble was excited when he saw that Derrick Henry was put act, reactivated off the IR today because they are now going to be able to run the football like they haven't been for the last few weeks. And here they are entering into the playoffs with this bowling ball primed, fresh, and ready to knock down defenders. So Tennessee's in a good spot in regards. So the, the running back spot is – you know, I think it's it's so important. It's just been so tough to find it. Steezy, you said it's easy to find them, but they're not necessarily that easy to find good ones because we've been looking for the next Marshawn Lynch for years, right? And we've gotten close, and we've had flashes of this guy and flashes of that guy. But man, it's just been tough to to find that combination. And maybe next year we could have them both back if Kurt Warner is wrong. We could have you know, Chris Carson and Rashad Penny back. So I want to ask sort of this other question, running back question to you, uh, Kurt. Chris Carson. We okay. Know his, we know his story. He's been riddled with injuries, but this is the first time, at least that I know of, they said that he's had this neck, neck issue that has been lingering. I was like, wait, what? This is the first time I've even heard of it, about this neck issue. But anytime you say running back and neck, uh, any and really any football player and neck is never a good thing. I want to ask you, Kurt, as, again, as a guy who's played the, the game for a long time uh, back in the day, uh, this injury that he has, can Chris Carson come back from it the way that he runs? Is it really realistic for us as fans to expect that Chris Carson can put on a uniform after neck surgery and come back next year and be productive? Well, I think you just answered the question. Uh, his running style is like a battering ram type of comparison and uh i i i don't know I, I i would find it very difficult for him to to be able to uh to not re-injure himself because of the his style of running uh i i would be very uh concerned if i were in his position knowing that uh, there's there's another life after football and uh to, to what extent do, do i want to take this chance of of getting out there and getting and getting injured again or hurt again uh, severely hurt uh 
so he, he's got some things to, I, I think, to, to think about uh, long term, not just football, because at some point it's going to end, which we all know if you, if you, if you played. Uh, at some point, it's going to end. So, what's it? You know, what kind of a what quality of life are you looking for after it's all said and done? So, that's kind of my take on it. Uh, he he is a uh, he's a physical runner, and he's got a neck injury. And uh, I know Cam Chancellor ended up uh, stop, uh, ended up uh, not playing any longer because of of a neck injury to him or neck injury to him. So I, 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 it doesn't sound like it's the same thing, but when you say neck and you say football and you say running back, well, there's a number of things to consider. Yeah, Cliff Averill, same same situation. Max Strong. Max Strong uh, was one of the yeah. best fullback Seattle's ever had. As soon as that neck became an issue, he was out of there. You know, uh, didn't want to mess around with it. Uh, Alina Dahl, who's a moderator on the YouTube channel, big, big uh, s- a supporter of mine, she says to you, Kurt, Kurt, thank you for bringing excitement to the team and the city and me. Do you have a particular game moment that sticks out? Thoughts about bringing back the original uniform, which I think is coming the year after. Mm. Looking forward to that. How many times do you have to say, no, I'm the other Kurt? <laughs> <laughs> you might get that more often now they got that Kurt Warner movie uh, coming out or right. maybe it's already been released. Uh, a few questions from uh, Alina. Thank you, Alina, for the super chat. Um so there's a few things to digest on. That. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I've had to say, yeah, the other Kurt, the other Kurt, yes, the other Kurt Warner, yes, I've had to say that <laughs> on a few occasions. Uh, and and I don't mind; he's a nice guy, good guy, so it's it's all good uh, with regards to that. Uh, as far as games are concerned, I would say probably the uh, the '83 game against Miami uh, when we were able to. Uh, to go down there and, and, and beat them, being the underdog that that we that we was, and and more more importantly, any game that included the Raiders was probably our favorite game because we just didn't like each other uh, at that time. Uh, so uh, that that was a fun rivalry uh, to go up against, uh, and uh, it, it was a lot of fun uh, from a number of different perspectives. Yeah, that Miami so Dolphins. Does that answer everything? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was great. That Miami Dolphins game, I, I probably have to definitely put that one because that, that one was a game that nobody expected the Seahawks to win. And when you guys pulled that thing off, uh, I remember you had a touch. You had one, at least a, one touchdown run in that game. And then Steve Largent, I think. Yeah. Uh, had a, I think he's, didn't he score the winning touchdown, if my memory serves? Was it Steve Largent? I, I don't know. <laughs> he may have. Anyway, it was uh, it was it was a great game, and that was uh, uh, I definitely remember that one. So yeah, thank you, uh, Alina, for for the question. So uh, I'm going to hold your feet to the fire again, Kurt, because you're you're going into Russell Wilson mode, and uh, you didn't really answer uh, the question about Chris <laughs> Chris Carson. Will he be back next year? Yes or no? I think he will be back. I just hope that uh, that he stays healthy and the neck is not an issue. I think if the neck is not an issue, I don't I don't see any reason for him not to be back. But I, I hope he just considers uh, just how serious that injury is to the neck. And uh, he's uh, I don't think he's going to change his running style, uh, which uh, it's too late in his career to do that. So I, I, it is a tough question to answer. Will he be back? Yeah, I think he would want to be back. I think he wants to play for the Seahawks. Uh, this may be one of those situations where uh, it just may not be healthy and good for him to play. Uh, so that's from that perspective, that's how I would answer it. I wouldn't answer it. I would answer it differently if you said, hey, yeah, he's going to come back and play. But being that he's, he's injured, it, it just makes it difficult. To yeah. answer your question. No, I, I know. I, I know these aren't easy, Kurt, but I'm, I'm, I, I didn't put you on here to have easy answers. So, uh, <laughs> but I like, yeah, I think you're right. I think he'll play. I do. I think he'll be back. I do think he'll play, but yeah, how many games? That's really the, the question of how long can he last? I mean, this year he only played, what was he four games? Four games. Before he went out? Yeah. Four games. Yeah. That's not even, that's not even a fourth of the yeah, season. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's how it, it, I think the question is how, can he make it through the season? I, I think he'll start out, uh, but the question is: Is he going to make it through the season? That, yeah. That's I don't know. Yeah, I don't. 
So I want to welcome the fourth member, the, well, the fifth member, if you include uh, everybody in here. We got uh, Daniel Dovin. Daniel, who's been uh, uh, sponsoring my show and being a partner through this entire season, the ups and downs, a lot more downs than ups, unfortunately, but uh, we're here anyway. And Daniel, I'm glad uh, to see you on here. Daniel, welcome back to the round table. How are you doing today, man? Thanks so much for having me. I'm doing well. Is that Kurt Warner on the phone? The Kurt Warner, and that's not Great. Kurt with a K. Kurt with a C. <laughs> I don't really like Kurt with a K, to be honest with you. You know, it's oh, all about the ground shots. and pound game. Yeah, there you go. Shots fired. <laughs> so you're not, you're not, you're not going to go run out and watch the Kurt uh, Kurt Warner movie that I don't even know if it's out <laughs> if it's coming out. Can't believe they actually made a movie about that. But hey, whatever. No, <laughs> the NFL loves the Rams yeah. apparently. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, Anyway, so, uh, yeah, I just kind of throw it around. We were just talking about uh, Chris Carson, whether he'll be back. I, I forced Kurt to answer that question. And he says yes with an asterisk. Uh, so, uh, tentatively, yes, he'll be back. The question is how, how many games will he play? So I want to go around the oh. horn to you guys, uh, yeah. uh, to uh, to the, the other members. Do you agree? Will Kurt uh, – well, that's Kurt. Kurt won't be back, but will Chris Carson <laughs> be back with the Seahawks next year? Daniel, since you just got in here, what do you think? Yeah, you know, I think that he will be back. I think Kurt is right. It's a matter of how many games. We've had this in our heads for a while. At least I'll say Seahawks leadership has been really thinking about a two-headed monster for a long time. They've wanted Chris Carson as the hammer, and they've wanted big back Rashad Penny as the changeup, and then they drafted these kind of, you know, shiftier, smaller guys, right? Um, from University of Miami to kind of compliment and be the kind of J.D. McKissick, if you will, which I've missed him, by the way, ever since he left. But I, I still think that is the goal, ultimately, is Carson and Penny. They have been thinking about this and dreaming of this as the championship backfield. So I, I don't think the dream is dead yet. I've been following Chris Carson on social media just to see if I get any hints. You know, he's always training, and uh, I think he's a new dad, so... Um, I think um, that's always good for healing, uh, good family time. So I'm hoping for his sake, his career sake, his long term, you know, longevity as as a football player and, and as a man that his neck is OK, you know. Um, but I think there's concerns because I think he had to get it fused. And I, I think that, uh, you know, we, we know it's well documented how, you know, things ended with people like Cam Chancellor. So uh, it is a scary thing. Max Strong as well. Right. So. Um, is a very, very scary thing. So, um, you know, I'm praying and hoping he does come back because, you know, that's been – I think that's our best chance of, of winning, and I think we would be a very dangerous offense uh, with all, all those weapons in place. So is that a yes or a no? Yes. It a is yes. a yes, okay. but if I, were to, if I were a betting man, would I bet that he would play 17 games plus next year? I'd say no. Oh yeah, I don't think anyone would take that bet. Anymore. But I would take half of a season. I'll take half of a season. Well, I take the second me. half of the season plus playoffs. <laughs> I don't know about the first half. I, I, I want I want them together though. Thunder and lightning. We got to get the, the combination. <laughs> um, hey, Squabo. So how about you? You want to weigh on uh, on this? What you What do you think? And and at the end, you must answer the question with a yes or a no. <laughs> okay, I, as many of you know, I've been on the Chris Carson is on the way out train since before most in Seattle, right? I've been saying it for how many years now? Like over a year at least. I've been saying his time is limited. He's injury prone. His style of running back, like what Kurt Warner was saying, is that because he's such a physical guy, nobody gets healthier playing NFL football, especially not when you play that style of NFL football. Uh, he's one of those guys where he's just going to quickly fall off a cliff. And it's unfortunate to say because he's one of the one of the guys that puts his body on the line for the team. So if there's anyone I want to pay, even though he, you know, he is not as productive as he once was in terms of who deserves it. I think Chris Carson is on that list, but I think he stays in Seattle. I think he plays less than half of a season. And I think it's one of his last years in the NFL if he's still in the NFL after this season. And I don't think it's because he's incapable of it. I think it's because of his health. And it, I think he, after this year, is probably going to retire or something along those lines. Okay. Uh, well, so, uh, uh, that is still a yes. So I guess I'll take that. Uh, Steezy, how about you? Carson, back with the Seahawks next year. 
So I want to preface my comments by first saying that I hate to be the guy that speaks on someone else's money or earning potential. You know, I'm not knocking that at all. So I just wanted to put that out there before I say what I'm about to say. And his cap hit next year is six point four million. If Rashad Penny is going to get anywhere around five, six, seven million, there is no way we're, we're paying both these guys upwards of ten million, especially given their injury history. And so. His cap hit of six point four million. If that's going to remain, he's not coming back to Seattle next year at six point four million. And I'm sorry, but that's just the reality of things in the NFL. That's just the rea reality of the business that is the NFL. And so, if we're going to resign Rashad Penny, they both can't come back and pay that much money. And so, I don't know if I'm not going to sit here and say that. Oh, Chris Carson, take a pay cut. You know, I, Chris Kurt Warner talked about it earlier. Running backs, especially running backs, their careers and their their earning potential is a little shorter relative to other guys in the NFL. And so, you know, I, I wouldn't if I'm the Seahawks front office, I, I wouldn't feel good. I wouldn't feel fair, you know, having to come up to Chris Carson and saying, yo, we need you to take a pay cut, especially as Squabo so eloquently said. Chris Carson puts his body on the line for the Seattle Seahawks football team. And I know he gets a, a rep for not being the, the healthiest guy, but I like to think that he's not as injury prone as people think. He just happens to miss games and miss time for us when we need him most. You know, and, and what so your, wait, what is your definition of injury prone then? We could talk about that another time. But I, I, just, I, just, I just feel like Chris Carson, he just happens to get injured at the worst times. But he's not as injury prone as other people say. And, like and maybe – well, that, Oh, yeah, that's – I'm sorry. Yeah, that's on a whole. That's on a whole another level. But he I, was, he was almost. He was almost at the CJ. Pro, I called him the CJ Pro Size of 2020. Uh, you know, and the difference though is CJ Pro Size never had the four game stretch where he led the league in rushing and tore up the place and made you go, "Wait right. a second. He never had that comeback moment. Rashad Penny did, and that just messed us all up because we we're like, "Oh, wait a second. Whereas CJ Pro Size just sort of disappeared into you know oblivion but but with pro size what he did do i think it was his first career start against the patriots on sunday night football he had almost 200 yards from scrimmage against the new england patriots and so <laughs> that was kind of the game that got kind of you know gave us hope and we were like yo if this guy could stay healthy i mean he's a complete back you know you could play yeah. him on all three downs he's a great pass protector and all that but going back to chris carson the reason why i say what i said about his you know not being injury prone as much as people think is because when I dropped my Chris Carson episode sometime last summer, I talked about how in the last two years, Chris Carson has played more games than Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley. Um, who else? I think it was Dalvin Cook. And then he might have played just a few less than Nick Chubb. And so these are some of the best running backs in football. And yet he's played more games than these guys. And so I guess that's where I'm going there. But at that number, he's set to get paid at next year. There is no way he comes back to Seattle with that number. We do have north of 50 plus million. But if you guys hurt Pete Carroll, he talked about how that money's going to run out fast. Chandler we got to reach out Quandre. Yeah. What was that? Chandler Jones. That's where it's going. Von Miller could be another guy if he leaves the Rams. You know, he cares talking about we need more pass push. Russell wants both of those guys to not be playing against him, but particularly right. Chandler Jones. I think he's friends right. with Von Miller, though, so he'll try to recruit him. We'll see. But if Chandler Jones does come to Seattle, we're going to need more than, I think it's five and a half sacks in 16 games because he had five sacks in week one and then five and a half the rest of the NFL. So if that's the sort of production that – that's going to come with him. I'd rather refrain from giving it to him. Um, but one last time, I think Carson, again, he's not coming back at 6.4 million. I don't see him taking a pay cut. So all those things being said, I, I think he's out of Seattle, you know, and it's, it hurts me to say that because I love Chris Carson. I love his running style. When squad first talked about, you know, hopping off the Carson train about a year and a half ago, I was like, no, no, no. Like, I, you know, I don't want to see that happen, but like I said, it is the reality of the NFL. It is a business. And um, despite us having all that cap space, Fact of the matter is we got to resign a whole bunch of guys. Russ is putting pressure on us to win now. And so we got to, you know, either sign a big name free agent or two or or go after, you know, a few different guys in the trade market. So there's just no way we could justify being able to pay both these guys that much money. Wow. Debbie Downer over here, man. You just bummed me out. <laughs> you bring up a good point. There is, there is the financial reality, which we are faced with at every turn uh, with all these players, especially with all the free agents we have. Kurt, I wanted to ask you a question. We, we're talking about uh, running backs and when their time they decide they're going to be done or whether the injuries pile up. I want to ask you, um, I know that you – didn't finish your career in Seattle that you ended up playing. Actually, wasn't it for the, was it for the Rams? The Rams. You, finished your, you went to the Rams. Yeah. Of all, of all teams. Yeah. I, I want yeah. to ask you 
for you, when did you know it was time to retire? What was there something that happened that kind of signaled it's time? How did you know for you that your time as a running back in the NFL was done? Well, let, let me answer that question this way. It, it took me years after I was uh, fired from the job to realize that I probably wasn't as good as I thought I was. So no one with, uh, with egos, in, with, with your personal ego and your personal uh, accomplishments or your personal goals that you put in play, you never, ever think that you're, you're not good enough to play. It's just the reality of it is that someone is going to come in and replace you and you're just not as productive as you once was. So that's a hard reality to have to deal with. Uh, and it takes some time to, to let that sink in. It probably took me three or four years afterwards to realize that, okay, maybe I wasn't as good as I thought I was at the time I was let go. So, but you know, like I've said it once and I'll say it on many occasions. Uh, it, it, it is a business uh, and you are replaceable. And when it's time for you to leave, you're going to have to leave. Whether you go somewhere else or you, whether you finish your career and you got to start into, you got to do something else. But it, it's just a matter of time. Yeah, we would all like to stay. Uh, I would have liked, loved to have stayed in Seattle and uh, played for as many years as I possibly could, but things happen, injuries occur, and you're just not as good as you once were when you were 21. I think back, you know, when you played your time, you were playing in the hard, concrete, uh, astroturf oh, yeah. surface <laughs> yeah. of the kingdom, which was not exactly uh, yeah. the, the best thing for your knees. You, you tore your ACL, was it the 1984 season? The beginning of the 84 season, I think. 84. Beginning 84 season. Let yeah. me let you know a little other little secret as well. Okay. I was operated on uh, throughout my career about, uh, I think, six times or so out of out of uh, my eight years. So, yeah. you know, there was uh, bone spurs, ankle injuries, lower extremities, two knee operations, uh, four ankle operations. So, uh, it, 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 and I, and I would blame it on that turf because you just can't play on concrete, concrete and uh, football. It's just not a favorable, uh, scenario for anyone. Uh, so, uh, the good thing about it is that the field conditions have changed. Uh, and, and, and guys are, you know, they're able to, to, to play longer. They've got better, uh, better equipment. I, I don't know, but, uh, you know, it's still the game. It's, it's, it's a collision game. It's not a contact sport. It's a collision sport. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, uh, it is rough out there playing against these guys. It's like a fist fight pretty much every down. And at some point or every play at some point, and, and at some point you just can't, you just can't continue to do it. Uh, now, obviously, there, there are guys who can, who play for longer periods of time, uh, preferably the quarterbacks, uh, but uh, there are some other exceptions out there. I want to ask you another question before. I do want to get to the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the other big highlight uh, uh, headline things, which is you know the defensive coordinator firing and, of course, the rumors about Russell Wilson. Uh, but before you get to that, I want, I want to ask you one more question because um, you, you talked about how it was a violent sure. game. Back then, we didn't have the player protections that we have now. It's a much more protected game uh, in terms of you know, potential for injuries to, uh, to <laughs> certain players. Definitely quarterbacks and receivers are much more protected. Now, running backs, I don't know. You guys, they still get banged up pretty badly. But for you, what was the – player that you hated going against or maybe what was the you know like the guy that you, the hardest hit you ever took i'm just curious what are some of the names that, that stand out from back in the days when football was a gladiator mean violent sport way more than it is now you know what it wasn't just one guy uh that uh that you were concerned about every guy on the other side of that football can play and they it, it, and they're tough. 
I mean, they, they, it's not, it's not a, it's not a, a place to be for the faint of hearts. Uh, but if you're talking about individuals, uh, Lawrence Taylor uh, was as advertised. Uh, meaning that he did exactly what you saw him doing on film and he brought it to the football field and that's how he played. And uh, it, it was, he did not, uh, he didn't mix words. He, he was the, he, he was one of those guys where you had to kind of be watching out for. And there were a number of other guys out there uh, that you would have to pay attention to, but for the most part, everyone out there could play you're not just out there because they like you. This is not a political thing. Uh, you're out there because you can play and you can play well. How the NFL works. Yeah. Lawrence Taylor. Yeah. Yeah. He was one of the, one of the, one of the baddest ass guys out there for sure. We've seen him wreak havoc on many guys uh, back in the day. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you how bad Lawrence Taylor is. I'll tell you how tough he is. Okay. Uh, we were uh, in New York. And uh, we had a, uh, it was a, uh, it was a punt return. And Lawrence Taylor was on the punt team on their end. And he ended up tackling the guy on our sidelines, right? And he just, he got up in the middle of, of, of our team and just let out a loud scream, like, ah, you know, <laughs> kind of like that. And no one on our side did anything we just looked at him and we thought as, as advertised this guy's crazy he's literally crazy and nobody said a word to him you know normally you come on somebody's sidelines talking you're going to get pushed around right you, we're not going to take that but in his case nobody said a word <laughs> other than the fact that we were thinking this guy's nuts he is crazy oh man that's so good. that's how much that's how respectful he was as a football player, uh, because he could bring it on, on numerous occasions, and he did. So, yeah, he sure did. He, 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 was, he, was, he, he was he was uh, he was tough on, on on the defense. That's for sure. So, um, all right. So, speaking of defense, I want to get a quick kind of just comment on the firing of Ken Norton Jr. Um, uh, I know a lot of people wanted him gone. I kind of want to get the take. Do, do you, are you guys? Did they make the right move firing Ken Norton Jr.? Was it time? I'm going to start with the, the round table and the court. I'm going to go to you too. So let's go to uh, Squabo. Squabo, uh, what's your thoughts? Was it was it the right move? Was it like a finally or not? Well, uh, allow me to introduce Kurt to my hot take, man. I thought Pete should have gone. And so if Pete's gone, that definitely means uh, Ken Norton should be gone. So I, I, I think Ken Norton is going to take a lot of the blame that quite honestly belongs to Pete Carroll. But Pete Carroll has proven to be a successful coach. I just don't think we're going to be able to win another Super Bowl with him. Now, what it's going to take is this defense better be better. This defense had better start off hot and stay hot. Every single year over the past couple of seasons, we've gotten half a year of some of the best defense in the NFL, and we've gotten half a year of the worst defense in the NFL. What this move means is that, all right, Pete, it wasn't your fault, even though you're a defensive back and a defensive coordinator by heart, well, then you better bring in someone that's going to get us results wire to wire because otherwise I, I still put the, the point, the finger at Pete. Okay. And I know you've been very clear on the record saying that uh, you've been wanting to see Pete gone. You thought he'd be gone. And I know before the show started off air, you already told me that, uh, well, Norm, I think I might be owing you a steak dinner here. <laughs> and Daniel, that goes to you because we talked about this. We got a bet going on here, Kurt. I don't remember Squabos that, Norm. And Daniel, we had, a, the, we had a bet. The bet and was. I bet you didn't record it. So there's it's no proof. out there. There is no, no. denying the <laughs> agreement. The agreement was if I believe it was that I, I said Russell Wilson and Pete Carroll are both going to be back next year. And you, the, the the deal is, if that doesn't happen, you got I got to buy you guys steak dinners. If they're both back, you have to buy me steak dinners. Now we got a long way to go, and there's still another equation to this. But Pete Carroll still here, Ken Norton Jr. gone. What do you think about that move, Daniel? Well, 
I would agree with Squabo on the first point that if Pete was gone, obviously Ken Norton would be gone. Um, it does feel a little bit like a scapegoat move um, because ultimately Pete is a defensive coach. He has specialized in safety play forever. And I think that Ken Norton was always, if you ever watch him, He's always focused on the linebackers because he himself was an excellent linebacker. You know, he won three straight Super Bowls as a player, which is crazy. And um, I think, what, two or three different teams in that span. But anyway, um, he is a great linebackers coach, but I don't think he's an expert in all things defense. You know, um, I don't think he's he's great with the defensive line. I don't think he's great with the safeties or the cornerbacks. And as you can see with like people like Chris Richard, he might be really good with corners or safeties, but you might not be good with the whole thing. It takes a very special type of coach to be able to lead an entire defense. And I think that, you know, the old school approach on our kind of three deep state and was uh, the, I forget what we call it. Um, the, the zone defense that we normally play. I think that old school approach um always came from Pete Carroll. So do I think that firing Ken Norton's going to be, um, you know, the thing that puts us over the edge? No, but I do think that maybe Pete could relinquish some control to a, to a, a, a new coach, depending on who it is. Right. I've, I've seen articles that talk about, you know, people that come from, is it a uh, Fangio's tree? Right. And then you have the really young coaches that you could go with as well. And so for me, I think the odds of things actually changing go up if we, if we get a really young, innovative coach and Pete Carroll actually like relinquishes a little control, kind of like what he's he tried to do with Shane Waldron on the offensive side. Maybe that was part of the conversation with Jody Allen. You know, you never know. But it, I think it would have been more appropriate in my opinion to have him kind of demoted back to linebackers coach, but you never know. Maybe he didn't want to do that. Um, and it, it is, you know, a pride thing too. And maybe they just wanted a fresh start. Long story short, it'll come down to Pete. And if he can relinquish some old school ideas, um, because we need a fresh look. I think we have the athletes on defense and I think we can add to the nucleus but I think some of the stuff we tried this year, I hated to see Puna Ford um, in, in, in pass coverage. That's crazy. Uh, Carlos Dunlap in pass coverage. That's crazy. Puna uh, Ford almost had an interception. I don't Puna care. Ford had, had a ball in his care. hands. If he could have held on to it, he could have had a Alan pick. Robinson in, in pass coverage. That's crazy. Um, I, we tried some weird stuff, and it's, it's just very obvious to me that, um, you know, Ken Norton Jr. was never like the overall schematic genius that you kind of need when you're playing uh, the the Rams and the 49ers and the Cardinals these days. Like, look at how young the coaches are. You know, Sean McG McVay's like 35. That guy's like 35 years old. Anyway, so that's my hot take on it is I think we need to either be innovative or we will die. All right. Well, we've yet to find out who that new replacement is going to be. Obviously, watching very closely because that will tell a lot of what's going to look like uh, in the defense in 2022. Steezy, how about you? Uh, what did you think of the Ken Norton Jr. firing? So when I heard about it, I knew instantly that Pete Carroll was here to stay. And uh, like D Daniel said, Ken Norton was just kind of the scapegoat. Um, but it's only going to be a successful <laughs> firing. Um, if we hire a defensive coordinator, that's not just a yes, man, because Ken Norton Jr., I'm with squad, you know, and I've been on record saying this. Ken Norton Jr. is taking the fall for something he probably doesn't deserve to take the fall for. I mean, I know he's calling plays. I know he's calling the shots. But at the end of the day, he's running Pete Carroll's defense. And Pete Carroll has a lot of say in what goes on on that defense. He has a lot of say in what players are being called. He has a lot of say in where players are being positioned. And going back to Daniel's point, I mean, Carlos Dunlap jack, dropping back in coverage, Puna Ford dropping back in coverage. It's somewhat understandable just because this year we kind of moved to more of a bare front, more of a 3-4 style of defense. But when you look at Carlos Dunlap in his last year in Cincinnati, part of the reason why there was such a fall now between Carlos Dunlap and that Bengals front office was because they were dropping him back more in coverage. And the more that they dropped him back in coverage, the worse that that defense looked and the worse that Carlos Dunlap looked. And so 
the reason why he had such a slow start, or at least part, part of the reason why he had such a slow start to the year is because he spent so many snaps dropping back in coverage when that is not his specialty. His specialty now, especially as he gets older, is to be more of a situational pass rusher, is to just you know get after the quarterback. And so even in limited snaps, even in limited action, he was getting after the quarterback like the man possessed. I mean, my gosh. I think at the halfway point of the season, he had one sack. He ended the year with eight and a half. He led the team with eight and a half. And so... Um, Pete Carroll talked about how he wants to bring more turnovers. He wants to to get after the quarterback more. And with Ken Norton Jr., uh, he just wasn't doing that, I guess, in, in his play calling. We need to bring in a guy who's not a yes man, but we also need to bring in a guy who's playing chess and not checkers. Because another great point that Daniel brought up was, look, look at our division. I mean, we're going up against, you know, guys and Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan, uh, Cliff Kingsbury. Uh, and they're all somewhat renowned for, you know, being offensive masterminds, offensive geniuses, or at least they put together more than just competent offenses. And so we need a guy who I feel like has had success, you know, in the league before, you know, Gus Bradley, Mike Zimmer, before he was a head coach of the Vikings, he, he was a phenomenal defensive coordinator. Some guys are just better built to be an offensive or a defensive coordinator as opposed to being a head coach. Cause Mike Zimmer, I don't know how you guys feel about him as a head coach, but him as a defensive coordinator, he's one of the very best out there. Vic Vangio, uh, He's one of the very best out there. I doubt he'd be willing to be a defensive coordinator. Brian Flores could be a great defensive coordinator. There's so many different names out there. We had success with Gus Bradley before. And so this only this is only going to work. This is only going to be successful if Pete is willing to, to kind of give a little bit more leeway towards whoever he brings in. And if he brings in a guy that isn't scared to, to speak up or speak out against what Pete Carroll brings to the table. And I'm not saying that Pete is wrong and he doesn't know what he's doing, but at the same time, you could always use, you know, more innovation. You could always use a fresh face. You could always use, you know, a guy who's, who doesn't necessarily come from your background because then you get a fresh perspective on things and you kind of build, you know, different, I guess lines of expertise when, when you when you're willing and when you're open to bringing in guys that kind of defer from your philosophy, if even just a little bit. And so like another point, just like Squab said, I mean, the defense, while we've had great finishes to the to the last couple of seasons, we just can't start off the way that we've been starting off. I mean, the worst defense of football, Ken Norton Jr. definitely deserves a little bit of blame for that. And so um, I guess I'm willing to give him a little bit of blame. But Pete Carroll has to change if the next hiring is going to be successful. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a lot of pressure on this next hire for sure. Uh, it, it feels almost like deja vu when you think of uh, what happened last year with the offensive coach, uh, the, the uh, offensive coordinator firing, and then getting a new one this year. It's almost the same thing where, well, you're changing this part, but is he really the reason we failed? But obviously, we didn't improve from last year. But I still don't think Shane Waldron's the, uh, to blame in this. There was a lot of factors. Again, I blame a lot of the injuries and things like that as part of the, the, the reason for the offense. But for the defense, yeah, we can't afford to be the last team. That's two, twice in a row, two years in a row, to have the worst defense in the league. That ain't going to cut it. So, uh, Kurt, I want to get your take. I know you're a running back. You're an offensive guy. But uh, what did you think of the firing of uh, Ken Norton Jr.? Did you think that was the right move? Hey, Norm, before I, I get into that, I'm going to have to get off the phone here pretty soon. So, oh, okay. Uh, but I will more than happy uh, answer your question. Okay, gotcha. Uh, and let me just start by saying this. Uh, it wasn't that long ago uh, when the Seattle defense or was known for uh, being probably one of the better defenses uh, in the NFL. And there was a stretch of about four or five years where we were just playing a, a base cover two uh, with man-to-man -man coverage on the outside and a front seven that was probably as physical as I've ever seen in the NFL. Could match up against anyone and uh, could put pressure on the quarterback, could stop the run. Uh, it was just phenomenal. Uh, prob I, I mean, just one of the better defenses I've ever seen. Unfortunately, uh, uh, when you have success, uh, you know, people leave. They get paid more money. When you win Super Bowls, people leave. People get paid more money uh, uh, offensively, defensively, and just from every different angle. So, uh, and, and here's where we are. Uh, whereas we have a, a defensive coordinator uh, and, and a defensive scheme that's last in the division. Well, someone has to, to be the fall guy for this, and unfortunately, it, it's Ken Norton. But ultimately, the head coach 
is responsible for it. And, uh, and, and obviously we're going to see what happens next year uh, as to where, we, uh, where we're ranked and how we play defensively and how we play offensively. Uh, so, you know, it, 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 it's a tough thing to, to, to analyze, you know, Monday morning because we all do Monday morning uh, quarterbacking to a certain degree. Uh, but uh, it, it's obvious that there, there's a problem with the defense. Uh, and when you're ranked last, uh, you go from being a top defensive team to basically a last place defensive team. Heads are going to roll. And unfortunately, it's, it's Ken Norton. So that's kind of my take on it. I, I, you know, hopefully they'll bring somebody in uh, that, that can uh, put together a, a, a defensive scheme uh, that works for everyone. Uh, but, uh, you know, players have got to play and coaches have got to coach and hopefully they can, they can put it together and, and play better this year than they, than they played in the previous two years. So that's kind of my take on it. It's, it's just kind of a general take on it. I can't nail down anything specifically, uh, because it's just, it, it, there's so many things that were wrong that uh, you're going to have to go back and revamp the whole thing, I think, from a defensive perspective. Yeah. So, Kurt, I know you got to go. Kurt Warner, former Seahawks running back and uh, in, inducting the Ring of Honor. So before I let you go, i got to ask you one last tough question. It won't take you long to answer. Russell Wilson. Okay. Russell Wilson. Everybody's talking about it. The rumors are still flying around. <laughs> Fit to the fire, Kurt Warner. Will Russell Wilson okay. be back right. as our – quarterback long term is he going to be back as a seahawk yes or no oh you're not giving me you i i don't even have chance, i don't have a time to, to sort of uh, sort through it i've got to give you a yes or no i i would say yes he's going to be back okay well that makes me feel there good. you have it Okay. Safe for Norv. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, Kurt. Well, thank you again for taking the time. I know you're on here for a long time and you got to get to where you're going. So thank you again, my special guest, Kurt Warner, former Seahawks running back and member of the Ring of Honor. Thank you, Kurt Warner, for joining us today, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Kurt. Nice to meet you, you're Mr. Welcome, Kurt Norv. Warner. Okay, guys. Thank you, sir. All right. Nice to meet you guys as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, Kurt. Love to the family. What's thank up? you very much. All right. Okay. That was Kurt Warner. I appreciate him taking much more time than uh, I originally thought we were going to get from him. So I'm uh, glad he could give us a little insight. So speaking of, now that we're talking about Russell Wilson, I guess we can talk about the latest uh, rumors that are going around. It seemed like we were heading to a point where Russell was being asked and he says, you know, my goal is to win more Super Bowls. And I, my, my hope is to do them here. And it seemed like everybody was on the same page. Pete Carroll was saying, yep, well, the nucleus of the team is here. Then we get a report from Ian Rappaport saying Russell Wilson wants to explore other options. So all of a sudden we're back to this. Oh my God. Where's Russell Wilson going? Is he going to be here next year? La, 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 la. What were you guys' reaction to this? Does this change what you thought before hearing this story and that this is just all kind of, you know, media stuff, or do you really still think that there's an issue? Uh, about all right. Russell let me Wilson go. Let me go year? first on this one, yeah. please. All right. <laughs> I okay, so originally I was all on board, like Russell is leaving, he's for sure gonna go. And then it sounded like Russell wanted to go, his agent wanted him to go, but Pete Carroll and John Schneider were kind of mum, and then Pete was like, He's not going anywhere. And then it felt like okay, Russell kind of came around, he said, Go Hawks a few times, everyone's feeling a lot better. But then I just watched an interview with Pete Carroll and his tone of voice when he's talking about his meeting with Jody Allen, he got asked that directly by Aaron Levine of Q13, and it was like, well, we, we are going to explore every avenue possible to make this team better. So he left the door open again, and I'm like, what's going on, guys? So at this point, I'm betting on Mark Rogers. His agent wants him to leave. I think Sierra, who knows, 50-50 chance there. And then I think Russell is all he's all about winning. And I think there's some ego involved as well. So I think it kind of depends. I think it depends on what people offer them. I think it depends on 
the cap hit, I think how many first round draft picks do we also get a starting caliber quarterback with the trade? Like, do we get, you know, um, Carr from the Raiders? Like, do you want Daniel Jones really from the Giants? You know, like it really depends, but I, I don't like that there's still the door open. But I think this is just going to be ongoing. I think the NFL and these media guys, they just want headlines, right? So um, for me, it it feels like there's an 83% chance he's coming back. But, you know, the 17 is pretty big. It's bigger than it's ever been um, in my mind. So uh, Pete Carroll leaving it open-ended was surprising to me because he for this whole time he's been saying, no, he's our guy. No, he's our guy. It's not a story. He's our guy. Now he's like, well, maybe it depends. We'll look at every avenue to make the team better. I'm like, mm, sounds like some politics to me. So that's my uh, take. Alina, uh, Lena, our fabulous moderator, just said in the super chat, she said, if Russ is leaving, then why did he just open a store in Seattle for his clothing? Well, uh, he <laughs> theoretically, Russ could – Playing devil's advocate now because I like to think that he's going to stay here, but he could open any shop, any number of places, and still play football somewhere else, right? I mean, that's the reality yeah. that could still happen. Totally. He doesn't have to be anchored to where his businesses personal. are. This is a you know, you can you know, with that kind of money, you can fly and move wherever you want to. I still, well, I'm gonna hear from you guys I, before I get my opinion here. Let's, let's go over to uh, Steezy. How about you, man? Um, what do you make of the latest? Russell Wilson rumors. So real quick, Norb, just to kind of piggyback off of what you were saying, um, if you look at or if you want to look at it in terms of reverse psychology, right, you could also look at it from the point of view of, OK, yeah, he has schools here. Yeah, he's opening up stores, but maybe that gives him more reason to leave Seattle because then it's like, OK, I've done all this for the city. I'm doing this for the city. Now I kind of have like an escape. You know, now I have an out to leave Seattle. You guys can't hate me because I'm still doing this for the city. I love the city. And he's showing that. He means it when he says he loves the city, but he also did say that he loves winning. He loves legacies. And, and so he could still hold on to, yeah, I love the city. I'm doing this. I'm opening up schools. I'm opening up stores. I'm doing this, but I also love winning. And so he could justify him leaving, you know, with, with all that. But um, honestly, I think you guys make great points, you know, when you talk about, oh, just the media fabricating stuff because, yeah, they want to make headlines. But at the same time, Russell Wilson has a no trade clause in his contract. Why would you say that? Oh, yeah, of course, I want to stay in Seattle. I love Seattle. You have a no trade clause. You're you're in control of your future. Seattle can't just trade you anywhere, which is what Seattle tried to do a couple of years ago when Cleveland had the number one overall pick. They, they were in talks to trade him maybe not to draft a uh, Baker Mayfield, but those talks actually happened. And, and those talks before Russell Wilson signed his last extension, there were talks of maybe him going to the Giants if, if Seattle couldn't come to an agreement. And so I think that's actually the biggest reason why he asked for a no trade clause. It's so that he wouldn't just be traded anywhere and so that he's in control of his own destiny. And, and so for him to leave it up to the team, uh, to me, that's just fishy. And I don't know if you guys were watching the Manny cast this past Monday on Monday Night Football, but they had they reportedly had an agreement not to talk about Hawks talk. Well, isn't that what he did? Last last year, he took it to the media. That wasn't fabricated. That was all him. He's the one who complained and told Dan Patrick that he's getting hit too much and, and complaining and doing all that stuff. And so Corbin Smith, uh, Sports Illustrated Seahawks reporter, he asked Russ in one of his final press conferences, yo, so you have a trade clause. You're in control of your own destiny. And, and Russ was talking about, oh, yeah, you know, just so that, uh, you know, I don't get traded to a place that I don't want to get I don't want to go to. And that wasn't verbatim, but that's pretty much along the lines of what he was saying. But I just find some of these things fishy. You know, he's had so many different opportunities and chances to address his future. He could easily say, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm here to stay. I love Seattle. I'm here to stay. And he keeps adding the but, the but, the but, the but in the butts like oh but i also love winning but i care about my legacy but i have to feel like we're building a contender and a winner and, and so i feel like this offseason if we're not aggressive if we're not making moves if we're not signing free agents if we're not bringing back our guys if we're not addressing the trenches he's definitely as good as gone i mean he just doesn't sound committed if you think about it last year we go 12 and 4 win the division and yet he still wants out or it seems like he wants out and so i know he was injured this year and that's probably the reason why we didn't go to the playoffs but think about going 7 and 10 and think about how you feel after that if you wanted to leave after 12 and 4 what about 7 and 10 and so i don't know i feel like i'm just kind of i'm starting to see cracks in the armor i'm starting to see the writing on the wall and um i just i don't want 
to have him here if he's not fully, you know, fully committed. It, it, it almost seems as if he has one foot in, one foot out. And, and I just don't I don't want a guy who's not going to be 100 percent all in, who's not going to be 100 percent committed. And just to have all those butts and, and to leave all the speculation. That's why all these trade rumors are running rampant. It's because he's allowing it to. And we all we always talk about the Seahawks monster, right? How we want to keep everything in house. Well, he broke the number one rule last offseason. And so now this rumor is coming out again. He still hasn't addressed it. He still hasn't really, you know, erased all that doubt. And so I get it. The media wants to create stories. You know, it's their job. At the same time, it's also Russell Wilson's fault. And so we can't just completely blame the media for putting stories out like this when he could easily address things. And so and then that one interview before the game against the Lions, he's talking about how, oh, I know you guys asked Bobby Wagner about his last game in Seattle. And as for me, you know, I hope this isn't my last game in Seattle, but I know it's not my last game in the NFL. What does that even mean? <laughs> he had another game. He had another game in a Seahawks uniform the very next week against the Arizona Cardinals, even if it wasn't in Seattle. And so a lot of these things, it's just really fishing to me. Um, I always say the grass isn't always greener, um, but I don't know. Um, with Sierra in his ear, you never know what's going on in his head. Um I don't know. I, I feel like the rumors and all this trade speculation, it's just a continuation of what happened last year. I don't really think of it any differently. I don't look at it any differently. And um, man, this offseason is just going to be dominated by Russ yet again. And I just don't know how the front office is going to feel about that because that's not how we do business. So, of course, he's got the no trade clause, but <clears throat> the only way that Russell could be moved sooner than the end of his contract is if the Seahawks decide, OK, we don't want you anymore let's move you somewhere and let's talk about where you want to go. Right. I mean, the Seahawks have to decide they don't want him anymore either because Russ can't, the only way Russ can get it, force his way out is he would have to make a strong stand that I don't want to be here anymore. Right. He can't just, he can't just go because he wants to go. He has to force the hand of the Seahawks to make that happen because he's still under contract for two more years. So, or, or are they just talking behind closed doors? He just says, look, guys, I, really don't want to be here. Let's figure, let's work something out because, you know, I'm just done in Seattle. So I hope that's not the case, but I do. I, I am sick of all the coded words. The, I hope I can be here. Right. It's my plan to be here. Can I, but, can I just interject yeah, that, that I, yeah. And Squabo, Squabo, did, you're, you're going to get your turn too, but go ahead. Russell Dan. did say it really straight up to Corbin Smith's question. And that was the best response he's had. And, yeah. you know, and then he started the go Hawks thing. He, he definitely said for sure, like, I want to be here. That's what I'm saying is it went back to like, okay, I felt good. And then Pete Carroll said his open-ended thing after the season, which that part is the one that confuses me because they're ultimately the ones that can say, hey, we're going to trade you to Chicago. You want to go to Chicago? Okay, cool. You're going to Chicago. You know what I mean? But Russell by himself can't do it. So that's that's what's more concerning to me is if, you know, Jody Allen's like, well, whatever's best for the team, look at every option and what's best for the bottom line, too. You know, if we can get younger, faster, stronger and cheaper, then let's do that. You know, I don't know. So that's the part that concerns me more. I think Russell, he's been saying everything right, in my opinion, lately. I think he's been all in lately, you know, but just my take. Well, and, and I, I get to play devil's advocate. If he's asked... Uh, are you going to be with the Seahawks? If he's tr- really being truthful, he can't say for sure I'm going to be here because there's that possibility that the Seahawks could make a move That's that would be indicating that they want to part ways with Russell Wilson. So theoretically, it's not a unilateral control thing that Russell can decide all that I will be here because he's not to- totally in control. Each Each side has some bit of control on this situation. So... It's just the, the playing the playing the word game is frustrating. Press conferences in general are just kind of messed up anyway. I don't even think we should have press conferences, to be honest with you, because you never get the true truth. And if you say the truth, you get you get yelled at, you get in trouble. If you say what's on, look at Dak Prescott. He said kind of what he really meant at the time, and he has to take it back and he gets fined twenty five grand for saying the wrong thing. And then if you ask the and if you don't say the truth, you say the right thing. Everybody doesn't believe you. So it's it's a lose lose situation when it comes to press conferences. To be honest with you, all you, you can come from never, that, get more mad know who never has and a feel press deceived. conference is Trey Flowers. He never presses anyone. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Swabo, <laughs> your Swabo, take next. Your take, Russell Wilson. Mm. <clears throat> this is what we got to touch on here. Okay, um, I'd like to start with. 
Norb, just for the record, if Russell Wilson leaves, that means we don't know you a stake. So I just want to put that out there. Um, I'd buy, <laughs> right. but yes. I, that being said, Norb, I would get you 10 stakes if that means Wilson gets to stay in Seattle. Because I want Wilson to stay in Seattle. Now, there is something that is being gravely overlooked in this stream. And I've heard the three of you talk about how confused you are by the words that are being spoken by Pete Carroll, Jody Allen, and Russell Wilson, amongst others. The problem is actions speak louder than words. And I have some actions that signal to me Russell Wilson might be on the way out. Here are some of those actions. Oh, snap. First of all, when there's an old phrase, and I've heard it said about women. I've all, I'll just say it about people in general. And tell me if y'all have heard this. When someone completely changes their hairstyle, it's a sign that they're going through a life change. Have you heard that? DK every week? <laughs> Bad example. I, uh, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> Yes, I have heard that. I have heard that. But that's I, may have heard, I may have heard that. But, so when, okay, but the, the, the idea behind it is that when a drastic action changes that they haven't been doing, it's because mm -hmm. something in their life has changed and they're going to shift. Okay, so for the past three off seasons, every single off season before the year is even over, Wilson has come out and said, I want playmakers. I want a superstar. I want protection. I want offensive line. What has he requested this off season? Nothing. He's complimented the offensive line. He's complimented his team almost as if he's on the way out. He has changed from requesting and speaking up to fix the roster to complimenting it as if it's his last way of saying goodbye. He hasn't requested changes. Have you guys been following his social media? Because mm -hmm. I, we haven't even talked about one of the most important, one of the most potentially showing of a move that's going to come up post that he just let out on January 11th on his Twitter. And Norb, you might want to pull this up because there's a picture of him in the tunnel in Seattle in black and white, not showing the color of the uniform on his way out. The caption is light at the end of the tunnel, very reminiscent of Tom Brady's post from right before he left new England, but there's more. I don't know if any of you noticed who he tagged in the photo. He tagged his company, West to East Empire. West to East? Wow. West to East Empire. That was always a funky name. Which is always, always about <laughs> merchandise and all that stuff. But the fact that you tag them in this, where you're not showing the color of the uniform, showing that you're an NFL player, but you're not alliance to a team. Do you see the, uh, that is one of the biggest signs. When does he do stuff like that? When okay, does he hold on time out? I'm going to play that, devil's advocate real quick. All of the posts by that company are always in black and white. And it was taken by Daniel Mogg. Who's like his, his, his guy who runs that company. So I'm going to play devil's advocate. I don't think it's that weird. Very reminiscent to the Tom Brady post right before he left. And then you factor in all the stuff. You are all confused because you're listening to everything that they say, and they're speaking out both sides of their mouth. And that's how it's been, and that's how it's going to be. But it's the actions that are different. It's the fact that he says light at the end of the tunnel, and that's it with the West to East Empire. How are we not supposed to look at that and think something could be fishy with everything else going on, with the fact that this is the first offseason? What has he requested? He hasn't said, go get me a weapon. He hasn't said, go get me a lineman. He hasn't said, go get me a running back. He hasn't said, go get me a superstar on defense he hasn't said anything that is different than what he's been doing every single year until this year we have come on this show and talked about how he wanted an all-star we got him an all-star he wanted protection we got a protection the Gabe Jackson trade the Jamal Adams trade the making moves to go make things happen and then now we're all just focused on what they're saying it's not about what they're saying it's how he's acting and the fact that he's acting like that tells me that He's working on something else. He's working on, if I'm going to get out of here, how are we going to make it happen? I've been on record saying, if the trade's going to happen, Las Vegas Raiders is where I think it's going to happen because we're not going to find a draft pick capable They're very, uh, of replacing him at the quarterback position. They are very hungry within that division. They are against two 
quarterbacks, probably three after this offseason when Denver gets Aaron Rodgers and uh, that are better than Derek Carr. And this whole mentality in Seattle is defense and run game. Derek Carr can do that. He's loyal, which is what we need. I think Russell Wilson's actions are what are the most scary thing out of everything. Not anything that he said. But it's the fact that he's not out here trying, actively trying to go get Von Miller already, actively recruiting already for this offseason. He hasn't been doing that. And that is what concerns me. And, and Norb, um, Squab, that was beautiful. Um, <laughs> if, if I may, I, I don't know if you guys could see this, but it was around Christmas time, right? And, and so I don't know if you guys know this as well, but part time, I, I work at a Lids at, at the South Center Mall. And so I'm always around, you know, a whole bunch of Seahawks stuff, you know, merchandise or whatnot. I don't know if you guys could see this, but there's a Russell Wilson jersey, a home jersey on sale, 30% off. Can you guys see that? Yeah, yeah. 30% off. And I was talking to someone who had a uh, who has somewhat of a high position behind or, or in the lids corporation. And I asked him, I was like, yo. Why, why is a Russell Wilson home jersey of all jerseys, the home jersey, Seattle's jersey, our jersey, why is that on sale? Because every time I see a jersey go on sale, it's always because that player is on his way out. The last jersey that I saw on sale was uh, – there were some football ones before this, but there was a James Harden jersey, a Rockets jersey, and literally two weeks later he was traded to the Nets. Um. But but what this person told me, he he's a little you know higher ranked and within the Lids Corporation. He told me that when it comes to um, jerseys like that being put on sale, it's because the NFLPA they're the ones who tells the corporation to put it on sale, and that's because they know of things before anyone else. The NFLPA, and I know we didn't make the playoffs, but a Russell Wilson home jersey for that to go on sale, I think that that's very telling. And so that's why I asked my dude, I was like, yo, like, why is this on sale? There's no, this has no business being on sale unless he's on, unless he's out the door. And the fact that he told me that, oh, the NFL PA always knows before the public. That was, that was scary. And, and I've been meaning to put, I think I posted this on my Twitter not too long ago, but I'm going to post it on TikTok. I'm going to post it on Instagram. Cause if he does leave, I'm going to be like, yo. I took this the week after Christmas, and I knew he was out the moment I recorded this. And there's a reason why I recorded it, just to have a little bit of proof and evidence. And to me, that was just – that was kind of fishy, um, and that's kind of scary. So just to kind of piggyback off of what Squad was saying in terms of actions, this, this might not be actions on Russell Wilson's behalf, but actions on behalf of the NFLPA. Well, so what your bottom line, what you're saying is – if you want to find out which players are leaving their teams, just walk into a lid store and look at the price tag. Thirty percent. I'll tell you. I'll it's tell you who's coming and going. No, because look. So That's look. One crazy. more. One more thing. So I brought this up to someone else who works as a security guard for the Seahawks, and so he has a little bit of inside information. And he told me that, oh no, that that doesn't mean anything. You know, uh, Russ is here to stay. You know, I'm I'm here in the building. I'm I'm outside of the building. I know what's going on. And I'm like, okay, well, why did we pick the home jersey to go on sale? Because like I said, that's our jersey. That's Seattle's jersey. That's their home jersey. And so why couldn't we pick a color rush jersey to go on sale? Why couldn't we pick a, a Wolf Ray jersey to go on sale? An away jersey. Why is it the home jersey? That's our jersey. And so I, I don't know. That's very fishy. He was very silent afterward. He didn't have any words. So Was, was Bobby Wagner's jersey on sale? <laughs> There's actually, Rashad Penny, Rashad Penny's jersey on sale, Chris Carson. Hmm. That that is very interesting, man. I hope I hope you guys are way off on this. I hope I am too. I hope I'm way off too. Because that would really suck, man. But I, I believe me, it's frustrating as a fan. I hope Wilson gives us a the... list of demands. Okay, Squab, but one thing is it's barely into the offseason. The playoffs are still going on. He's probably not going to be recruiting Von Miller while he's preparing for, you know, the next NFC uh, division game. You know what I mean? So I think give it some time and Russell will be happy when we don't re-sign Dwayne Brown or our center, Ethan Posick, and we get the left tackle from the Saints or something. He'll be very, very happy then. Um, we're going to spend money this offseason. I think this is really the boomer bust year uh, w with the squad that we have, you know, and 
the grass isn't always greener, guys. Like he he's gonna have to say goodbye to hot Rashad Penny, Chris Carson, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, Gerald Everett wants to come back most likely. Uh, you know, like we have weapons on offense, we have good camaraderie. We just didn't play a lot of three phase football games this year. If we had won those close games, we would have been 12 and five. If it just flipped a little bit, you know, so I don't think the sky is falling as much as it felt like this year. And I think in inside that locker room, them winning the way that they did at the end of the season actually feels a lot better to them than it does to us on the outside where we look at the macro you know, they're they're playing, and if they can put up 51 points or whatever, they're feeling really good going into the offseason. You know, even if it's against scrubs, they don't look at anyone as a scrub in the NFL. So, like, they're like, who cares if we beat the Lions, you know, and, like, a Cardinals team that's, like, not really trying to play us. They're trying to get ready for the playoffs. Um, I think they're feeling all right. Um, but I think the free agents being added to the nucleus, I think that's going to be a really a really big part of this. The well, big questions are running back and DK Metcalf. Can he have a bounce back year and get healthy? I think, I think if those things happen, we have a good shot. We just need a legit left tackle and a legit center. I like the rest of our squad. So with Daniel though, like I feel like, and I, we got to nail you down here, man. Cause I was supporting your argument. You're the one that said 17% chance Wilson's gone. Yeah. So then what's this? Oh, but when we get a tackle, what does that percent go to then? And when we get a center, where, you know, I, I like think that where, goes up to 90 percent. 90. Yep. 90, but Daniel, 90. If we get if we sign the Saints left tackle or I think the Chargers left tackle might be up to. I was looking up top. No, he's a rookie. Agents. What's that? He's a rookie. Uh, Rashawn Slater. He's not. He's not. OK, there's someone else legit, though. I know that the Saints guys is there but anyway i think if we put the weapons around russell's gonna run it back again i don't think he's opposed to drama though i think that he likes the attention and i wouldn't be surprised if we did this again next off season i'll meet you guys here next season <laughs> i'll be doing the same thing owing norb more stake every single year well and, I, and and we should be clear the bet was about 20 2022 Right, because right. now 2022, who knows what's going to happen there? But where the real discussion, if he if he does come back next year, which I still think he will, the real drama is going to be next year because that's when it's really time to pay the piper, One right? That's year. when it has to be the, the year before you know you would sign, right? I mean, after next year, then he's got yeah, one year left year. on the contract. Mm -hmm. That's generally when the decision to keep a guy is the contract's going to be done. They're not going to wait till the right. contract expires and then go through that whole. So if they really want to keep the guy, it's going to be done at least a year uh, with, with one year remaining. Plus it's quality. You know, it, could be, it could be done earlier, of course, even now if they wanted to right. do something. But next year, to me, is going to be the real high drama one. If this wasn't dr dramatic enough, next year is going to be the, the real crazy one. So, so Daniel, right. real quick. Sorry, Nora, but real fast, no, go ahead. Because I don't know if you were here uh, at the beginning of the show, but I talked about how, yes, we do have north of 50 million in cap space with the potential to increase more, depending on, you know, if there's any sort of pay cuts, restructures Bobby. and whatnot, if we release anyone. Right. But PK was also on record saying that that money could dry up real fast because we have to resign a Quandre Diggs or a Rashad Penny, a, a Gerald Everett, a Puna Ford. Uh, give him an extension, DK Metcalf. Uh, and there's so many different guys to you know that we have to sign. And so, with that being said, we're not going to have money to bring in a top tier left tackle because those sort of guys they demand 18 plus million at least and at the very minimum. And so, there's no way we're about to spend about a third of our cap on one guy when we have so many holes. And, and so, we have so many different free agents to resign as well. And so, I like the logic i like the idea behind what you're saying but it's just not realistic because then if we spend a third of our money on one guy how do we address the rest of the holes how All do we right. sign the, the answer. rest of our Here's guys the answer we're going to unfortunately cut bobby we are going to re-sign quandre he's not going to be particularly expensive unfortunately the timing of his injury is terrible like we all want to pay quandre he deserves it he'll get a significant amount but not what he would have gotten had he not gotten so severely injured on the last possible game where he didn't even need to be out there. That being said, uh, we will get a left tackle. 
and we're not gonna Hope. we're not gonna re-sign Dwayne Brown. If we do re-sign Dwayne Brown, it's because we couldn't get anyone else and we get we got him at a discount. His last press conference, someone yeah. asked him, Hey, are you flexible on the amount of money that you want? And he was like, Yeah. I don't know why he answered that, but he said, Yeah, I'm realistic. I, I want to be back here. Cause he knows that the odds of another team giving him a two or three year contract at this point in his career are very <laughs> low. His best bet is coming back here at like five million bucks because we couldn't no find way. anyone else. No, I'm I'm saying he's That's... the last resort. But we'd like to spend like $18 million each on like a pass rusher and an offensive tackle. Just just watch. I'll bet you a stake, Steezy, that cool. that we will do address the trenches with the money and then we will still have money to re-sign people. Bobby will either need to restructure or he's gone with Ken Norton Jr. And they're both going to a place where they can be together in linebacker heaven. Okay, but Daniel, two more guys I didn't bring up, and these are this is a very premium position. Cornerback DJ Reed finishes a top ten cornerback according to Pro Football Focus. He's going to demand a lot of money. No City Jones, DJ Reed, like significant money, bro. If Shaquille Griffin is getting damn near fifteen million a year, what do you think DJ Reed's going to get? Because DJ Reed is a lot you, better than Shaquille. Griffin. I guarantee you, DJ Reed will not get over ten million dollars a year. Steak, what? steak, steak. <laughs> oh, yes. no, oh, a lot of bits. On, on, no. on average, he will not get 10 not more than 10 or more guaranteed for sure. Wow. No, no, I'm sorry, Daniel. I'm sorry, but you are I'll way bet you off. A steak right now. So that, that, let's what do about it. me? I, I brought it up. It. <laughs> I'll, bet, I'll get both steaks. Five steaks. Five steaks. About, no, five <laughs> steaks. Two steaks. You and Squabble. Right, two steaks. Two stakes, but I no, I promise you, if it's not over ten mil, he is severely underpaid because he That's was absolutely I phenomenal. Think, I think they're gonna, I think they're gonna hate on him because he's small. I think they're gonna nah, hate on him good, because though. of the type of. Defense Are you talking about now? Is this bet just if the Seahawks resign him no, at any ten point. mil or any team, any team, so wherever he, he gets, goes? If he gets four years, forty-two million, I will, I will give them two stakes. Okay. What about Sidney okay. Jones? So Sidney Jones had a career year with us. He's not gonna get ten, but he'll get seven, eight, no. six, seven. <laughs> cornerback is a premium position. Cornerback is a premium position. Those guys get paid no matter what, especially when they hit the open market, regardless of how well they play. That, that's just cornerbacks, pass rushers, left tackles, premium positions. Okay, this is interesting. This okay, is so so this is official. So Daniel is betting Squavo and Steezy <laughs> that that DJ Reed is going to make average salary ten or less million per year guaranteed whoa whoa whoa, whoa. Guaranteed? I, I, I want i want 10 on our side i thought you said less than 10 that's what i'm saying i'm saying that if it's less under than 10. 10 guaranteed i win yeah so if, he, if so, so if it's four years 40 million dollars squabo and steezy win of course yes okay i'm, I'm okay. good for it okay all right, okay. you heard it here. Okay. We got another steak bet on the line. Well, there's a lot okay, of steak going to be thrown around. <laughs> <laughs> so a, someone's eating steak, and I don't know who it is. But no, You know, Norb and I both owe each other spam musubi, so we still got to make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You they they kind of nullified Norb, each so other. For all I know, Norb is four foot twelve. He's very short. I don't know. <laughs> it's true. We haven't met yet. We haven't met in person, so I can guarantee you I'm not four foot twelve. But I know. Okay, so I know time is running short because you guys, you got your show coming up, Squabo mm -hmm. soon, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So we got to we got to wrap things up. I I, I did want to wrap up. And let's do this real quick, like okay, because I wanted to get your guys's uh, prediction. We have to do scores. I just want to have have pickums of, of what the what the games are going to be this this uh, for the playoffs moving forward. Uh, I hate to stop. There's so much great stuff, but let's just do it real quick. So I'm just going to say the, the game, the matchup, and you tell me who wins. We'll go around the horn. All right. So tomorrow we got the, the divisional round between uh, in the AFC Bengals at the Titans. Squabo, who wins? Titans. Steezy. Titans, uh, they're a lot better on the interior, both uh, lines. So Derrick Henry's coming back too. Uh, mm -hmm. Daniel. Joe Burrow is the best QB on the field on Sunday, and the Cincinnati Bengals make it to round three. Round three. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So we got. Uh, well, I'm going to go with the Titans on this one. So three to one. Jamar uh, Chase, baby. He's pretty awesome. We'll see. I if, have uh, his rookie card. I'm not Ooh. willing to bet it for anything, though. But <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stakes is one thing. Rookie cards are a whole other deal. All right. Divisional round. 49ers at the Packers. Squabo. Oh, man. I wanted to save it for my show. Tune in for the reason in 20 oh. minutes. San Francisco. Nope. Oh. Nope. I'll <laughs> no bet way. you a Jamar Chase rookie card. 
<laughs> but I need something good in return. Uh, Percy Harvin jersey. Uh, nope. But I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Percy Harvin jersey. At least something good. Uh, no, nah, okay. I'm not. I'm not taking. I'm not that. Car, I'm not betting on the 49ers. I just think they're gonna win. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. 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 Does it. All right, Daniel, uh, tune easy. in in 20 minutes. I got some reasons. Okay. okay. All right, so I was, so, sorry to spoil it, but I definitely want to hear the breakdowns. Uh, so tune in to Squabble Says. Uh, Steezy, 49ers I Packers. Green, I think Green Bay is in for a scare, but I think uh, they end up prevailing. So I'm going to go Green Bay. Daniel. 100% agree with Steezy. I think it'll be a good game, but ultimately Aaron Rodgers, <clears throat> Devontae Adams, they're going to have a game as always. And Darius Smith just got activated off of IR. Yeah, you know Jimmy Garoppolo in Green Bay. Good luck in the cold. Hmm. Yeah, I got Packers in this one. Okay, uh, Sunday divisional round: Rams at the Buccaneers. Squabo. Rams. Oh, Steezy. I I want to lean Tampa. I want to lean Tampa, but Tristan Wirfs might not play. Playoff Lenny still kind of on the ropes. I'm gonna have to roll with the Rams. Guys, when will we ever learn? You never bet against Tom Brady. Ever. We're not betting though. We're not betting. <laughs> You're right. I'm, going with, I'm, going yeah, anyway. I'm not. <laughs> if we're not betting, then I'm going with the Rams. If I'm betting 100 percent Tampa Bay, it's All a right. cop Steezy, out. You got, you, got any, you got any rookie cards you want to put up for this? <laughs> I mean, I, I do. Hey, I do have quite the collection. I do have I quite the collection. Cortez he does. Kennedy, uh, rookie. Um, so here's the thing. Tampa Bay is super not healthy and it's very important that you're healthy this time of year and the Rams are getting healthier. Mm -hmm. So I I'm going to lean by like two points to the Rams. Right. I don't want it to be, well, actually no, I do want it to be just because I don't want Tom Brady to keep succeeding because to me, that's the blueprint for Russell Wilson to go. See, I want to do what Tom's doing. So right. I don't want Tom Brady to succeed. I hate to root for the Rams, but I'm kind of going for that, and I think it's going to happen. I think the Rams are going to barely get by Tom Brady and the Buccaneers on the road. Okay, final one. NFL divisional round. Bills. Oh, this is a good one. Bills at the Chiefs. Squabo. Buffalo. Yeah. <laughs> you looked unstoppable last week. Easy. Man. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if Buffalo pulls it out, but I think just like Green Bay – um, Kansas City will find themselves, you know, in a scare, but I think ultimately they prevail. Daniel. I think Buffalo can play four quarters. I think the Chiefs can play three. And so, therefore, mm -hmm. Buffalo is going to win in the highest scoring game of all time, 89 to 87. No, I'm joking. <laughs> it's going to be a very high scoring Steak. game. Steak. <laughs> yeah. 56 to 49, <laughs> Buffalo. Buffalo wins. Buffalo Bills, baby. I like wow. the Bills. I've always liked the Bills. You know why? Because Steven Hauschka. Hey. <laughs> and Marshawn Lynch. I Fair like enough. I like the Bills just because their fan base has suffered for so long. Mm -hmm. But this is the hardest one. I, I'm, I'm really torn on this one because I can yeah. see it going both ways. Chiefs are really hard to beat at home. They both have had stinker moments throughout the year, but they're both playing pretty good right now. But the Bills looking really, really good. But I, I, I feel like the Chiefs are going to they're, they're going to get the it's going to go. The, it's going to flow their way this time and they're going to find a way to, to slow down uh, that Buffalo Bills offense and the Chiefs will hold home serve. It's good, good matchups. I'm going to probably not even watch most of them because I'm going to be at my girls volleyball <laughs> tournaments. So I'm going to miss. Oh. I'll be about to watch on my phone for crying out loud. Download anyway. NFL mobile. North, yeah, I'll, I'll be NFL. watching. I'll be watching on my phone, yeah. but I won't be able to you know, like watch in the comforts of a nice room with a TV, but anyway, great games coming up this weekend. So I know you guys, we got to go because uh, steezy has got to get ready for his show. Uh, all right. Squabbo's got to get ready for his show. Steezy, are you going to be on his show too? Yes, sir. So you guys are both on, right? So you guys got, got stuff to do. So, all right. Uh, well, let's wrap this thing up. So uh, I, I will, I do want to give you guys a chance to quickly promote uh, what you got going on here. So uh, Squabbo, Steezy, maybe you guys can co-promote. Uh, you got a show coming up. Uh, what, what are you going to expect to see in the next, uh, what, about 20 minutes from now? 
15, 15, minutes from now. 15 minutes from now we're going on we're breaking down what happened in wild card weekend we're giving our power rankings of all the eight teams left in the nfl then we're predicting mm-hmm. what's going to happen as well as getting some more because norb you asked us what we thought about ken norton getting fired you didn't ask us who we thought was going to come in and replace him we're talking know, about we never that got to in it. 15 we never got minutes. to it. so you can answer that question yeah there you go all right. Uh, so definitely check out Squabble says all these guys' information is in the description. So go check it out. Uh, Steezy, you want to add anything to uh, to this? I know you'll be on the air shortly, but your own yes, channel. Sir. Um, yeah, just real quick. And as always, thank you, Nor, for having us. And, and shout out to Kurt Warner. I mean, I mean, that was dope. I wish we would have had more time. Shout out to you, Daniel, as well. I'll be expecting a few stakes, um, hopefully in the next <laughs> couple of weeks, sometime, sometime then. Um, but, yo, you know, everybody, like Squab said, at 3 p.m. Pacific time, tune in. Ask Squabble says on YouTube. Um, and last but not least, don't forget to, you know, don't forget about me. S-T-E-Z-Y-A-S-M-I-T-H. Um, Smith, S T E Z Y A S M I T H. I talked about this in my Rashad Penny video, but I did have a very long layoff, almost a month. And so I'm, I'm slowly getting back into the swing of things. I've dropped two videos in the last couple of days. Is Rashad Penny the future of the Seahawks at running back? And who's the last man standing in the Pacific Northwest? Is it Russell Wilson or is it Damian Lillard? Uh, if you guys haven't checked those out yet, please, please, please do that. And I'm about 18 subs away from 3K. So uh, oh, a shameless plug subs. here. But it's 18. 18 away from 3K. We can get that right please. now. Sum up Steezy A. Smith. Please and thank you. And, and squ- let's get Squab to a K, too. I, I put this down in the chat, but road to 1K and then road to 3K. Please, if you guys can help us do that, we tremend- we'd appreciate it tremendously. Um, but we love you guys, and thank you so much for tuning in. Shout out, Norb. Shout out, Daniel and Squab. I'll see you in a second, my brother. There. All right, Daniel. Uh, Daniel, uh, you're a quick yeah, little before like we sign up. I would just say thank you as well. And just for everyone out there, you know, first time I saw Squabbo and Steezy, I took literally two seconds and I subscribed to both channels. It costs you no money, costs you no time, and it makes a big difference to the people, you know, putting in time and creating. So definitely encourage you guys to do that. Super easy to do. Um, For me, you know, I I started a real estate team back in August. We're now up to 12 people. Super excited to, um, we're trying to help um, uh, at least 200 families this year. Uh, buy and sell houses uh, and and it's a really big goal um, but we're we're on our way to doing it so if you guys want to follow me it's just my name on instagram i'm pretty active there you can also find me on facebook tiktok is dove in real estate um those are the main channels holler at me if you guys need anything at all and um norb thank you so much as always and i look forward to seeing how short or tall you are uh one of these days <laughs> Pretty uh, short, sure. pretty short. Pretty. All right, we're going to wrap this up again. A special thank you to uh, Kurt Warner, former Seahawks running back, Ring of Honor inductee for taking the time to be with us as well. So, And most importantly to you guys, thank you for watching. Support all these channels and, and yours truly as well. We greatly appreciate it. All right, we'll talk to you guys next time on the roundtable. Until then, go Hawks. Go Hawks. Go Hawks.